Hi, it's me again. Do you remember me? Cat girl? It's been a while, huh? Yeah, I don't really like to film videos when other people are in the house. And unfortunately, due to circumstances, they never leave. I haven't left either. It's been bad. I... I... Uh, I made this. So in the last part, I summed up the series. So if you haven't watched that, then you probably should. I also brought up the Tumblr community that I stumbled across after having a red light crisis and how a lot of the community seem to really fucking hate warrior cats. Like there are blogs completely dedicated to warrior cats that have no interest in the books or else dislikes them in the way that they're written. And it's not like these are straight up hate blogs. A lot of them have an interest in the world of warriors and some are completely rewriting the series. Yep, back, uh, I'd say two or three years ago? Tumblr posts aren't dated, I'm sorry, but back when I was still in college, there was a trend in people rewriting the series. I can't say for sure who started the trend, but the most popular I've seen was the Redux. And one significant thing about this rewrite was how much of the smaller details in the stories were altered. Don't get me wrong, a lot of the major story beats were as well, but they went in and changed a lot of small things that have nothing to do with the plot or characterization. One major thing the Redux chose to do is ground warriors in reality, and most of the rewrites followed suit, many claiming to take a more realistic edge to warrior cats. And I don't know, this is odd, isn't it? Why do so many people want these talking cat books to be realistic? I guess to answer that question, we do have to ask ourselves, how realistic is warriors? I'm gonna need something to take the edge off. <laughs> So let's start off with one aspect that everyone seems to have an opinion on, cat genetics. Now, as a completely normal and well-adjusted college student, I had never put any thought into cat genetics. However, now I'm 24 and I know all about it and everyone hates me. I'm sorry, Katie, I diagnosed your cat as black tabby. But yeah, everything I learned, I learned from Tumblr, which is, uh, don't worry, I double checked everything. But yeah, there are people who take cat genetics seriously and hate that the warrior cats are not genetically accurate. And you might think that's crazy because it is a children's series. However, there were some genetic inaccuracies I noticed when I was a child. And if a child thinks you're bad at genetics, then you're bad at genetics. Okay, first off, Redtail. He's the second cat listed in the allegiances of the very first book and is the murdered corpse from the first book. He is a male tortoiseshell cat. Even as a kid, I knew that was wrong, but I read a lot of animal books, so maybe that's not universal. But a surprising amount of my friends know that tortoiseshell cats are always girls, they just don't know why. Um, so I'm going to explain how it works. I am so, so sorry. So every cat can be split into one of two different color categories, red or black. Brown and gray cats have the black gene, cream and gold cats have the red gene, and white cats can be either, but the white covers it up. Just pretend that the white is paint and it covers up the color underneath. The color that the cat turns out to be is stored in the X chromosome. Male cats only have one X chromosome and they get it from their mother. So male cats will always be the same color as their mother. Red mothers have red sons, black mothers have black sons. I know this sounds kind of racist, but I'm talking about cats, okay? I'm trying my best. However, but female cats have two X chromosomes, one from their mother and one from their father. So if they have a red mother and a red father, they will be red. And if they have a black mother and a black father, they will be black. But what happens if they have a black mother and a red father? Or vice versa? Well then, the female cat will get both the red and black genes and will thus be a tortoiseshell. In order for a cat to be tortoiseshell, they have to have two X chromosomes. So yeah, female, typically. It's not impossible for the male red tail to be tortoiseshell though. First off, he could be trans. I'm aware he is a cat, but the cats become ghosts and shit, so really anything is possible. The other way is that he could have two X chromosomes, which, 
while extremely rare, is possible. It's called Klinefelter syndrome. It's when males are born with XXY chromosomes, and yes, humans can have it too. It causes infertility though, and at one point, Roadtail was the canon father of Sandstorm. Uh, apparently that's not canon anymore though, so I guess take your pick on what you prefer. The second one I noticed is Black Star. So I mentioned that I read the second series first, and in the second series, he is already leader and his name is Black Star. So without looking at his description, I I assumed that he was black. Anyways, fast forward to when I actually got around to reading the first series, and his name is Blackfoot, and he's white with black feet. Cue my high-pitched chipmunk voice crying out, that's stupid, and now that I'm an adult with a Tumblr account, I can confirm, stupid. Now, like I said, the white simply covers up the coloring of a cat, and white spotting tends to follow similar patterns that have been well-documented over the years. Even the genetic anomalies have been well-documented, and a cat having white everywhere except the feet has apparently never been seen. Both of these characters are arguably the two whose appearance are changed the most by rewrites and genetic enthusiasts alike. Redtail is usually just made into a red cat or sometimes a red van and black star into either a Siamese looking thing or in the case of the redux they invert him to be a black cat with white paws which is genetically correct. I've also seen a lot of complaints about the character Spiderleg who is a black cat with a brown belly which yeah that's not the kind of marking cats have. They aren't Rottweilers, but black cats can get something known as rusting, which means that their fur turns brown if they spend too much time in the sun. And my black cat has rusting all along her belly. Her name is Ruby. No, she isn't red. Don't bring it up. She's very sensitive about it. But yeah, I think it's completely likely that one of the authors saw a black cat with rusting on their belly, and that's how they came up with Spiderleg's description. Another common complaint is with the eyes. A lot of cats in the Warrior series have blue eyes when they really shouldn't. In order for a cat to have blue eyes, they either have to be mostly white or color point, which means that they have darker colors on their legs, face, and tail, a la a Siamese cat, a la uh, what a lot of people think Black Star is. Or they have to be an Oho's Azul cat, which are extremely rare and probably wouldn't exist in a group of ferals. So yes, whenever a cat who is not white or Siamese is described as having blue eyes, it is genetically incorrect. This includes important characters such as Crowfeather, Blue Star, and Scourge. But here's why this doesn't bother me. If you swap out Blue Star's icy blue eyes for a more realistic green, does it actually change anything about her character? Not really. Does changing Redtail into a red van change anything? No, he still dies 30 pages in. The only genetic problems that would arguably change the story is the fact that in the books, Brambleclaw looks exactly like his father, Tiger Star, but due to male cats inheriting their color from their mothers, it's impossible for him to look exactly like his father and should instead be a more golden color like his mother is. Considering Fireboy spends most of the series thinking that little baby Bramble Kit would grow up to be evil because he looks like his father. Yeah, that would change the story, but I don't know. I still can't get myself to be outraged about this. Deviating away from the logic of real life is not a flaw of fantasy, and it's not like there's green or pink cats running. Oh, okay. Well, hmm. Actually, one of the authors has stated that she believed that mackerel tabbies, aka tabbies with up and down stripes, are green. This led to a lot of mockery. Fortunately, she's never actually put a green cat into the series, but even if she did, I don't know, how many animated shows, included anime, have human characters with unrealistic funny hair and eye colors? It's not a bad thing to have your character stand out. And honestly, Blackstar's weird feet are iconic. You see this fucker on the cover of a book and you know exactly exactly who he is, and isn't having instantly recognizable characters an important part of character design? And all this doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with using correct genetics or fixing the cats for fun or anything like that. I think it's interesting too. That's why I learned all this. I just don't consider genetics to be a major problem with the Warrior series. A minor one, sure, but I don't think it does any real damage. But okay. The genetics are garbage, I'll give you that one. What about other cat stuff? The cats are pretty well advanced. They make their own medicine. Surely that must be steeped in some kind of science. 
Well, the cats use herbs and medicine, and in real life, a lot of the plants they eat are straight up poisonous to cats. In fact, the plant knowledge in this series comes straight from an old English herb book that's nearly 400 years old. And Vicki Holmes makes it very, very clear not to use any of these herbs on your real life cats. I feel like this kind of thing is pretty standard for fantasy stories. Like, it's basically wizards drinking potions made out of newt eyes and whatever. I mean, the cats live in the woods, they can't go to the vet, so I get the need to insert a sort of healthcare system to explain why they aren't just constantly dropping dead. A socialized healthcare system too. You live in the clan, you get healthcare. That's just the way it works. I really like how the cats eat poppy seeds to dull pain. The opium crisis is alive and well within the Thunder Clan border. And why do they wrap wounds in cobwebs? What's up with that? Okay, well, we're not doing too hot. Um, hmm. Oh, cat behavior. Yeah, cat behavior. Surely the authors must have put well-crafted and well-researched cat behavior into their books about cats, right? Right? Throughout the entire series, house cats, or kitty pets, are described as being soft and unable to fight, and soft and fat, and unable to hunt, and squishy, and soft. In Starlight and Twilight, there were a couple of kitty pets who were aggressive and caused problems for the clans, but they are the exception. In fact, one of the main reasons Fireboy is invited into ThunderClan in the first place is because he actually turned around to face Graypaw when Graypaw attacked him. You reacted well to the attack, kitty pet. Graypaw is stronger than you, but you used your wits to defend yourself. And you turned to face him when he chased you. I've not seen a kitty pet do that before. Now, I didn't get a cat till I was 15, but I knew people that had cats. And I knew that their cats would get into fights and bring home dead animals and stuff like that. And now that I actually have a house cat, I know for a fact how tough house cats are. There was a point before Ruby's hair started turning gray, I woke up every morning to the sounds of her beating the actual hell out of the neighborhood strays. And okay, let's talk about that. See, in real life, if there is a conflict between two cats, they don't really want to escalate the situation because they don't want to get hurt. So they'll try and scare each other away first. They do this by screaming. This never happens in Warriors, and that's not a flaw, by the way. I completely understand why they wouldn't want that in their books. The concept of overly religious cats fighting each other to the death is hard to take seriously enough as it is without there being an extra 30 pages where they're just screaming. I just think it would be hilarious, you know? Like the Warriors movie's coming out. Please give me a scene where 20 or so cats just scream at each other for five minutes straight. <laughs> Please. The cats in the books are also active during the day and sleep at night. This is the complete opposite of actual cat behavior. Cats are either nocturnal, which means that they sleep during the day and are active at night, or crepusecular, crepsecular, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, I apologize, which means that they are only active in the early evening or early morning. The cats and warriors are on a much more human schedule, which, I mean, okay, it makes sense to humanize them to make it easy for kids to relate to. Vicky Holmes even says this during a Q&A. Right at the start of the series, we decided to make them diurnal because otherwise all the action would take place in the dark. We love our scenery, and also it would make the cat's experience even more remote from our own. When what I really wanted was to write about small furry humans with four legs. So I'm afraid you have to blame me for bending the laws of nature. Although Guardians of Kahul didn't feel the need to do that. I know that most kids already know that owls are nocturnal, so it's easier to incorporate it, but surely you could have just thrown in a line that was like, oh yeah, we hunt at night because that's when the mice come out. I think kids would accept that. Also, isn't it kind of weird that every kitty pet is capable of having kittens? Like, yeah, in real life, there's a lot of irresponsible people who let their cats fuck wildly, but there's enough people who actually cut their balls off that they should encounter neutered kitty pets quite often. And we know neutering is a thing in Warriors because it's brought up in the 
first book. Rusty chooses to join Thunder Clan because he is afraid of getting neutered. Then he encounters his old friend Smudge and find out that he got neutered, but after that it's never mentioned again. Like, Millie joins Thunder Clan as an adult after living as a kitty pet her entire life and has kittens no problem. Graystripe lived as a kitty pet for a while but was still able to knock up his wife. Sasa becomes feral after a lifetime as a house cat and she has kittens. Princess and Cody both had litters. Jake fathered at least two litters. There's a bunch of kitty pets that hang around and breed with <coughs> clan. There are many, many moments where cats are captured by humans and there isn't a single time where they come back altered in any way. I just find it kind of odd that they brought this element into the series, used it once, and then immediately dumped it. Which is kind of a shame. There's a weird amount of story potential with something like this. There's this thing called Trap Neuter Return, where people will set up traps near feral cat colonies, neuter any cats they manage to catch, and then return them to the wild. This is done in the hopes that the feral colonies won't be able to reproduce and will dwindle over time. And then tomorrow morning he will be off to the vet for his neuter. And then we'll have no babies this spring. Imagine a story set in the Warriors universe where cats keep disappearing, only to return two days later, but there's something different about them. They smell different, they can't have kittens anymore, and suddenly there's a shortage of cats who can actually reproduce. That might have some interesting story potential, I don't know. And from what I've read, TNR is something that happens in England, so it absolutely could happen in Warriors. Oh yeah. Warriors takes place in England, like actual England. The new forest in England to be exact, which is a real actual place you can go. However, in the second arc, the cats fight a cougar, an animal that only lives in North America. Now to be fair, the series has never stuck to its location. I've seen some flack slung at the character Hawk Frost because, well, hawks don't live in England, but a hawk was featured before his introduction in Book 5, A Dangerous Path. Y'all know the scene I'm talking about. And the Aarons have been pretty open about the fact that they changed the new forest layout to suit the story. So the setting was shaky from the beginning, and then at the end of midnight, humans bulldoze the new forest to the ground, driving the cats out. They end up at a location that, one, isn't real, and two, looks more like it should be in the Pacific Northwest, if anything. And don't worry, the new forest is fine. It's still there. Its destruction was a completely fictionalized event. It is odd that they chose a very specific location and then changed their mind six books in. Maybe they didn't like the box they put themselves in by having their story take place in a real location. Maybe it was too restrictive for the types of stories they were telling. Or maybe it was the decision of some higher up and we'll never know the reason. And it's a shame, I like the old setting but at the same time, I think it might be why so many people expect warriors to be grounded in reality. The books are about a real actual animal that actually exists living in a real place that actually exists. Stories that take place in a fictional land with fictional creatures usually aren't victim to so much scrutiny because there isn't any real life science on dragons or elves. And unfortunately for warriors, there are other stories that predate it that are drenched in realism. Water Sip Down, written in 1972, is also about animals that actually exist living in an actual place that actually exists. But the way that the cats and warriors and the bunnies in Water Sip Down are characterized are completely different. The author of Water Sip Down took painstaking efforts to make the bunnies act like actual bunnies, and any time where the characters act in a way that rabbits would never act is called out for being strange. The rabbits who live by the garden make art, and the main characters are unable to see any kind of image, they only see rocks. One rabbit starts laughing, and the main characters are scared because they don't know what the sound coming out of his mouth is. One character actually figures out how to make a boat, and the other characters are completely incapable of understanding what he has done. This is all really cool stuff, and the influence Water Sip Down has had over animal related media is undeniable. Hell, the whole humans destroyed our home so we have to go on a quest to find a new one thing from the second Warrior series is literally the plot to Water Sip Down. But there is nothing Nothing that says that the standards Water Sip Down held itself to should be held to all 
stories about animals. The author, Richard Adams, was heavily inspired by The Jungle Book, the actual book, not the Disney movie, and that he wanted to write his animal characters as realistically as possible. That's to say, although my rabbits could think and talk, I never made them do anything physical that rabbits could not do. This of course contrasts heavily with the Aaron Hunter approach to writing animals, in which they are small furry humans with four legs. And that's fine. There is no such thing as a perfectly realistic animal story. We as humans have no idea how cats and rabbits actually think. And I'd be willing to bet that Richard Adams' interpretation of the thoughts and feelings of rabbits are nowhere near accurate. And that's okay. These are fictional stories, not nature documentaries. And even most documentaries insert in a narrative. Just because two stories feature a similar element doesn't mean they have to approach it the same way. And it is worth mentioning that while Watership Down is often held up as one of the more realistic pieces of animal fiction, one of its main characters is literally psychic. The field, the field, it's covered with blood. Blood? That was sick. And the story ends with the main character dying and joining their god in the afterlife. And this kind of stuff is rarely brought up in discussions about the story's realism, despite being the least realistic parts. People are usually pretty happy to hand wave fantastical elements in favor of talking about the characters in the setting, which is usually fine, but unfortunately, a pretty common thing you see in fantasy stories is that sexism and homophobia are seen as being necessary to the setting, but no one ever questions the wizards or the dragons. Here's a warrior cat role-playing site that doesn't allow gay characters due to realism, but if you scroll up they talk about prophecies and dead cat ancestors as if that's a normal and expected thing. I also remember the Redux getting a lot of flack for this kind of thing back in the day, but to their credit, they seemed to have actually tried to rectify it towards the end. Warriors itself falls into this too, with Vicky Holmes infamously stating that there are two topics he never wanted warriors to cover. Drug addiction and homosexuality. Which is a uh, pretty yikes, but I'm choosing to give her the benefit of the doubt that by the topic of homosexuality, she meant that she never wanted a coming out scene or the cats being homophobic. I mean, she's been pretty open about Raven and Barley being in love, and there's been at least one new gay-coded couple since then. And I'm praying she doesn't fucking prove me wrong after this video comes out, but who knows. Water Sip Down does fall into this as well. A huge portion of the story is based around the entirely male main cast trying to find females to breed with. It makes sense in context. These are rabbits after all. They have the need to breed. And the book even calls out the fact that the characters are acting kind of shitty. Although, weirdly enough, while a focus on realism did make the character sexist, it also made them pro-choice. Yeah, so in real life, rabbits are able to straight up end their pregnancies, and this gets acknowledged in Watership Down, with a character saying that it's a doe's privilege to take them back to her body unborn. Wild, right? I guess maybe things being realistic doesn't necessarily mean that regressive stuff has to be the norm. Maybe cats really can be gay. The 600 page book I bought accidentally using my mom's debit card says they can, and even if they can't, is that really the hill you want to die on? When cats are running around dying nine times and getting reincarnated and time traveling, I won't say that realism doesn't matter, but I don't think it's the most important thing when it comes to fantasy. Because yes, Warrior's Cats is fantasy, even if it takes place in a real location and features real animals. I loved Watership Down as a child, but I didn't notice nor care about the realism. I liked the characters, I liked the weird situations they were getting in, and I was eager to see them accomplish their goals. It wasn't until I was an adult that I really appreciated the extra steps the offer took. Do I think it's a shame that the Aarons did absolutely no research before they decided to make a series about talking cats? Yes. Would it have improved the series if they actually did the research? Maybe? But to me, at least, making a critique of Warrior Cats and basing it entirely off of how it aligns with real life science is sort of like making a critique of The Lion King, but the whole thing is you just going like, Actually, Scar should be the most desirable lion because of his dark mane, and actually, Simba and Nala would be siblings, that's really fucked up, and 
actually, Simba would be extremely malnourished because lions can't live off of grubs. It's like, great, okay? You know some stuff about lions, but there are things like character arcs and themes that are also worth considering. And besides, if your critique of the warrior cats is only based around the scientific inaccuracies, then doesn't that kind of imply that the scientific inaccuracies are the only things wrong with warrior cats? Because woo! <laughs>